Ooh, hallelujah. That song just comes to my, oh, what a night. <laughs> Woo. Hallelujah. I mean, we got a little bit of rain outside. Praise God. Welcome to revival. And, uh, yeah, we bless you guys. Thank you for coming and being a part of 104 services. Wow. Woo. So I want to talk uh, tonight in Luke. Lord, we continue to stir up the Holy Ghost in this place. God, we thank you for what you're doing in the midst of us, God. We thank you that your presence, that you're, that you're here, but you're coming, Lord. You're here, but you're coming, God. We thank you. There's always more, Lord. There's always more. There's, God, you are never ending. Ha, your mercies, your glory, your power, your majesty. It's never ending, God. Ha, rabo kurianda basata, rabasata. Woo. We thank you, Lord, that you are not passing us by. No. <laughs> that we are here for such a time as this, God. And God, you have things going on. Praise God. Woo. In the name of Jesus. So I want to uh, read in, in Luke chapter 1, verse 1. And as much as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered to them, to us, the word delivered them to us. It seemed good to me also having a perfect understanding of all things from the very first to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theopolis, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. Hallelujah. I mean, he's, he's, he's really bringing in the detail here. I want you to know you can have certainty in what you're about to read in this gospel that he's writing, that this is an accurate gospel, and it's an accurate message about Jesus. Woo, hallelujah. Not only that, the Bible says these men were moved on by the Holy Spirit to write what they wrote. Woo, if they were moved on by the Holy Spirit to write this, we need to be moved on by the Holy Spirit to read this. Yeah. <laughs> Something happens when the Holy Spirit's inside of us connecting with the Holy Spirit that wrote this stuff. I mean, the Holy Spirit is like speaking to the Holy Spirit. And it's like, wow. <laughs> Charge this thing up a little bit. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. That's a pretty amazing testimony. And it's amazing how... The, the Bible doesn't uh, shy back from talking about people who are walking in righteousness. And it doesn't shy back about people who have committed sin. Bible's not shy about what God enjoys, righteousness, and what God hates, sin. God doesn't make it a gray area. He doesn't shy back from it. It's a shame that most of the church shies back we're afraid to talk about things but god's not afraid to talk about things and it's awesome that the word of god is written about non-perfect people 
It's awesome that God takes people from, especially in the Gospels, all kinds of people, young and old, all kinds of different, you know, from fishermen and tax collectors and the lower class, some of the upper class, and he, uh, those that allow themselves to be used by the Holy Spirit. And God, you know, it's not like this one specific group that God uses. And it's awesome that in the Word of God, it shows us that there's many different people. But the common denominator, it doesn't matter if it was a woman. It doesn't matter if it was a man. It doesn't matter if they were a Jew or a Gentile. The common denominator is the power of the Holy Spirit came on them. Woo! <laughs> That's what puts us all on equal ground. That's what puts us into a place like, you don't know what's about to happen next. <laughs> it's good to hang around people you're a little bit gun shy of. Man, I don't know what they're going to do now. <laughs> yeah, amen. Keep church interesting too. I don't know what pastor's about to do now. She's coming off the stage. She's about to sing and prophesy over people. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Keep people from falling asleep. <laughs> she may be coming this way. <laughs> you, <know? laughs> you don't know why when somebody may, the power of heaven may hit them and they just start. <laughs> During revival at one of the first churches, uh, um, a church that I was pastoring, the second church, actually, man, the power of God hit, and there was a lady on, we had pews, and she was on the left side at the end of the pew, and man, the power of God hit her, and she's normally a quiet, she don't say much, and man, she got to shaking and going on, and she had her grandson next to her, and like to beat him to death, not, not really, but, <laughs> I mean, he was getting like... <laughs> That night his mom came to church because she, <laughs> grandson came home telling mama, said grandma about beat me up at church today. <laughs> so mom came that night to see what was going on. <laughs> I can see some of y'all sitting spread out away from other people. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you can make sure they, they don't get too crazy and get on you. <laughs> Woo. You better watch Ken down there. There's no telling what he might do. <laughs> but they were both righteous, man. What a testimony in the word of God that God said, These, this man and this woman were righteous before me. They walked a righteous life. And it's, it's not when they're 18 or 19 years old. They're on up in age. And he's saying their whole life they've walked righteous and they've obeyed the commands of the Lord. He, he's not finding any fault to them. That's pretty powerful testimony. You know, regardless of what God does in our lives, one of the most powerful testimonies we can have is that we walked upright and holy before the Lord. Amen. I mean, we, we may not have won a nation to the Lord but if we could say that we walked upright before the Lord and our testimony to other people that know us is... That man or woman loves Jesus. Yeah. That's a powerful testimony. And you know, if you love Jesus and other people know about it, you can't help but affect their lives. Amen. It's going to affect people's lives. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and they were both well advanced in years. You know, it's considered almost a curse in their day and time for a woman not to have a child. And, and we read in the Bible others that didn't have children for a time. That God came and did something supernaturally. So they were without a child. They had a problem going on. And there wasn't a fulfillment. Even though they'd walked upright and holy before God. I mean, a lot of times people, when, when there's a sickness or there's something that's not happening, people want to look and say, well, they must have sin in their life. And that could be an occasion that you have something that's blocking the hand of God. But there's times when there is not sin. There's no sin here, but it seems like she's under a curse. She's without a child. So life, life is not fulfilled yet, and her heart's desires for a child. There's things that God has put in each one of us that, 
that we don't feel like, I, I believe even at this point, it's not fulfilled yet. There's something still coming. There's something I'm still left on this earth to do. I'm still breathing. I'm still walking. And there's something inside of me that I'm hungry for the things of God. Because I know there's more to this thing than what I've got a hold of. You know, I've been blessed to be in some awesome meetings at awesome historical revivals. Now they're historical 20 years ago. It's hard to believe I was at a revival that's older than some, I mean, it's longer ago than what some people our age. You know, how would it have been to talk to people, uh, actual people that had been at Azusa Street? You know, 20 years later, if you could sit at their feet, like the book that Pastor reads out of quite a bit, where Tommy sat at the feet of the elders, elder, they were elderly at that time, but they had been teenagers during revival, and he sat at their feet, and they told him stories about revival. I'm just thinking, I'm getting into that age where I could tell people stories about revival, about the awesome things God did in revival. But the good thing is... <laughs> I'm not satisfied. I mean, God's good and I love him and everything else. And I'm happy with what he did and what he's doing. But I'm really excited about what he's going to do. I mean, you just never know on this walk with the Lord when heaven's going to show up. You're praying. You're going after heaven. And, and, you know, we're blessed to have God showing up in power. But we got to recognize there is more available. To walk in a Native American church in Dulce, New Mexico on, on, for a one night service headed home, headed from Arizona back home. And they start worshiping. And then the presence of God comes and they just had a one tiered platform. But the, the guitar player and the bass guitar player and the drummer, the drummer fell off the drums backwards and the guitar players fell off in the floor. Yeah. And you're just showing up, you know, for one night to move on down the road. Well, that's what I thought. 20-something weeks later... So it's fun when you and the pastor and the pastor's wife and one of his sons and one other person get in the car to go out, go to eat down at the only restaurant in Dulce, New Mexico, which is at the, at the Ramada Inn. And you go in there and sit down and it's about three o'clock and so there's not many people eating lunch at that time. But the waitress comes out and they notice something's going on because joy's beginning to break out in our little crew there. We're having a hard time reading the menu and getting out what we want to eat. And the next thing you know, the waiters don't want to come over to our table. There's kind of a hallway and a place where the, the kitchen is, and they look out the hallway and look down there. And we were getting pretty uh, radical, I guess, or boisterous and then one of the ladies that's part of the church she was uh she worked in an office across the road there and she came over to get her hamburger she had ordered a hamburger and she came to get it and they had brought it out and gave it to us i guess they were really afraid to give it to her they didn't know what might happen so she tried to get her hamburger and he said we said no we're gonna pray over it before you get it we started praying and she hit the floor out there so these people are watching down the hallway. We got one on the floor now, and all of us are rolling around in the seats. I mean, you never know as a waitress what's going to happen that day at the restaurant. Then her sister had ordered a hamburger and told her sister, just bring it over. And he said, oh, no, you got to come get it. <laughs> then we got more people on the floor. I don't remember if we ever got to eat or not. We tried to make it out to the parking lot, and one a couple of them, uh, the pastor's son, was down on the pavement, right there at the tire of this big truck, in the parking lot. And I was like, "What are you, are you inspecting the tires down there, or what's going on here?" 
People were driving by and stopping and looking at us as we were dragging ourselves out of the restaurant because next door to the restaurant is a liquor store they call the zoo. <laughs> so they were uh, imagining that we had all been at the zoo. <laughs> then we drove down to the to the. Uh, uh, the elementary school to pick up the pastor's other son and we're sitting out in the car <laughs> kids are coming out and all these adults are sitting in the car laughing you know <laughs> Woo! we're out there having look like we've been at the zoo <laughs> another lady she come behind us from the church to come pick up her son she wouldn't park next to us she went on down the way <laughs> Her son had come out. Guess what? I just got out of the car and went down to where they was at. <laughs> Pretty soon she looked like she'd been at the zoo too. <laughs> then we decided to go to the post office. We sat in front of the post office for 30 minutes and nobody could get out of the car. I don't know if they had video projectors watching, but like, what's wrong with these people? They're, not, they're just sitting out there. And finally, we decided, forget it. We can't get out of the car anyway, so let's just go. <laughs> and went back to the church. So you just don't know what's going to happen when the Holy Spirit is coming. You just got to know this. The Lord is good, and he's good all the time. No matter what it looks like. No matter what you're experiencing at times, it may feel like God's ripping your flesh off your face. It's okay. You need a makeover. Some of you may go home and feel like you don't have to do Pilates tomorrow because your stomach's hurting from laughing. He's trying to help you build that six-pack. Probably not, but... <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know it's amazing you may roll around the floor when you get home you're gonna be you may be sore it's like man revival is rough you go to work tomorrow you're walking into work what happened did you fall down so no i've been at revival <laughs> man, it's like my body's sore all over <laughs> Or it may be your jaw from opening so wide. <laughs> There's this book about the Shintang Revival. <laughs> Happened in 1930 to 1933 in China. And it's, it's an amazing revival. I sometimes, I don't know, if I have it, I'll bring it one night. Sometimes I'll read some of the stories in it. And people are looking like, Wow. And then I said, you know, this was a Baptist revival, Southern Baptist missionaries. And I'll be in a Pentecostal church, and I'm like, the Southern Baptists have more of the Holy Spirit than we do. But one thing, one, one story talks about a, a guy said the Holy Spirit started swirling around and around in the room. And then it, he said God opened his mouth and just the wind went right inside of him. He said it stretched my mouth so wide I thought it'd break my jaws. And then the Holy Spirit went in. He said then for a while it felt like there was a thousand tiny magnets pulling everything out of me. So all the darkness was being pulled out of him. I mean, how do you explain this stuff to people? It really is not explainable. It's experienceable. It's, God's not interested in spectators. He wants participators. In God's game of life, nobody sits in the stands. He's calling everybody to the playing field. Woo. And he's got plenty of different assignments for each person that comes onto the field. 
Wow, the NBA got so upset they canceled the rest of their year. <laughs> nobody knew that, did they? Because nobody's watching the NBA. I just had to throw that in there. They're having a protest. I wonder if they're going to get paid. So here's Zechariah and Elizabeth, righteous before God, obeying the commands of God. But it still seems like there's something that's not fulfilled in their lives. Something is not going on. And, we, and we're, you know, we're kind of like a situation in America almost in some way. But here we are. Israel is not a nation. It's, it's ran by the Roman Empire. So it's a captive nation. They're not their own. They're their own people, but they're not their own nation. A lot of chaos is going on. There's been different, different factions rise up and try to fight the Romans and get destroyed. It's been 400 years since they've heard from God that they've had a prophetic word. Can you imagine 400 years? Nothing spiritual has happened. The sad part is the religious crowd still in the temple going through the motions like everything's okay. There's a lot of people in church today going through the motions like everything's okay. We've almost been programmed not to expect God to do something. I remember a, a, a pastor friend of mine, his brother-in-law, I was at their church preaching in Arizona, and God moved. And the brother-in-law, who'd been a missionary to the Philippines for years and had lived up uh, in the northeast for years, he said, that's, that's awesome. He said, one time at our church, God moved like that, but the pastor got up the next week and explained to us that we should not expect that all the time. It's just a sovereign something that God does every so often to them 15 or 20 years. So he's explaining to me not to expect that all the time. I said, you can not expect it all you want to, but I'm expecting something to happen. I mean, who, that's the craziest theology I ever heard. Yeah. God's a great big God. He knows where you're at, what you're doing, the number of hairs on your head. But he really don't want to show up and visit you at any time very often. He sent his son to die on a cross and shed his blood, be whipped and beaten, buried in a tomb and raised from the grave. But he don't want to come by and kiss you, but it once every 15 or 20 years. Wow. Who thought of that theology? He wants to kiss you every day. Yeah. <laughs> Psalms, in the book of Psalms, I think chapter 2 says, kiss the son lest he be angry with you. Amen. Woo, yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah that's so you can wake up in the morning with a smack. Here Israel's in turmoil, but Zechariah the priest is going into the temple for its t his time. It says, so it, was, so it was while he was serving as priest before God in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense and he went into the temple of the Lord. It may not be very often that he actually got to go do that because there was a lot of priests, so it wasn't very always a privilege to be able to be it fall on your time to go burn incense. But I, I bet it's, I wondered what he was thinking as he went into that temple. Yeah. You know, he's probably really preparing because it was a great honor to go in there and burn incense. But for 400 years, they'd went in there and burnt incense or a couple hundred years and nothing had happened when they were burning their incense. How did Zechariah know he was about to go light the candle and the power of heaven was about to show up in his midst? Oh. Woo! Oh. Just like 400 years, nothing. And now Zacharias. And I believe because he was righteous, him and his wife, because they obeyed the commands of the Lord, because it seemed like they were lacking, but life hadn't been fulfilled. And God said, oh, who? Zacharias, I can't wait till you get in the temple. Because I'm sending one of my main angels down there to check you out and have a little visitation. 
in the midst of all the turmoil and chaos, in the midst of dead, dry, dull, boring religion, heaven was about to show up. In the midst of our chaos, in the midst of our cities being burned, in the midst of rioting, in the midst of anarchy, it don't matter what plans a devil has, there's nothing he can do to stop the kingdom of heaven from showing up. You know, something amazing has happened. I don't know if it's because of prayers or whatever, but I believe it was Don Lemon on CNN that made the mention two nights ago that, you know what, these riots are not helping our voting. <laughs> he finally figured that out, that people were not excited about all this protesting. And he said something about it, but you know what the amazing thing was? Last night, Kenosha and Portland didn't have a riot. So somebody's turning the buttons. He comes on TV and says, we're not gaining any bonus points by this anymore. Next night, two main places don't have riots. I mean, this one's on this side of the country, and this one's on this side of the country. Tell us something ain't going on. But in the midst of it, it's the devil. Woo! Amen. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy. That's his job, and that's his work, and that's what he's busy doing. But there's somebody that came to give life and to give it more abundantly. That's his job, and that's what he's going to be about doing. See, something was happening at the temple. And I don't, I mean, we don't see the history of the previous years or the previous meetings at the temple. Or we don't know that maybe Zechariah had been talking to many people and saying, Would you come tonight to the temple? I'm going to light the incense. We need heaven to move. Would some of you show up and pray around the temple? We need God to do something in our nation. Maybe he was feeling the burning inside of him. The scriptures of old saying, there's one coming who will prepare the way of the Lord. Maybe something was burning inside of him. and I don't know what's going on, but there's something burning inside of me. There's something stirring inside of me. You guys have to get to the temple tonight and pray. I believe God's about to do something. I believe that's why he's bringing folks that we don't know, we haven't seen before. I hope something's being stirred inside of you. Say, we got to get somewhere and get with God's people. Surely somebody's meeting and going after heaven. There's somebody around that's going after heaven. There's somebody that wants to see a move of God. And the whole multitude of people was praying outside at the hour of incense it's amazing how God dropped that little hint in there we had somebody that's righteous and following the commands we have a group of people that are praying sounds like a catalyst for fire I mean what the Democrats. See, I didn't say anything political. (laughs) If you identify that as being political, then it may be true or something. I don't know. (laughs) Trying to stir this up. Really, the enemy trying to stir this up. But God's got... what, What it's really doing is causing more people to pray. I mean, if I lived in one of those cities where the riots was going on, I'd sure be getting up in the morning praying. Because, you know, in the past, we've depended on the strong arm of the government that the government would do what's right. But we're finding out now that 
that's not in their best interest. They want to do what's powerful. They want to gain power. And so we've trusted in the government. I believe it in Psalms. David said something. Some men trust in horses. Some men trust in chariots. But I will trust in the name of the Lord. So it's again like we've been talking about that God is leading the devil into a trap. Because yes, yes, yes. I believe he's causing people that were not even religious before, not even probably Christians before. But, I, I, you know, there, there is a lot of talk about this stuff's in the Bible. I mean, just about every TV and CNN and all those, every, there's somewhere that comes on good or bad that's saying, you know, some of this stuff was written about in the Bible. So it's opening up more and more people's, I mean, God is trumping the devil's plan. Hallelujah. In more ways than one. But the enemy has his plan and it's causing, I mean, trials, tribulations, and persecutions cause God's people in general, it causes fire to increase. Man, when a lot of things have been taken out of the way, a lot of uh, things that we did in our pastime, I mean, sports is just about being eradicated. Amazing. They've eradicated themselves. Yeah, they have. Yes, they have. We see whose side they're on. We see who they stand with. Yeah, I'll kneel too. They're about to eradicate themselves. I bet there's going to be some crying going on when we don't get our million dollar checks this year. So what's going to happen? We're going to replace all these stadium events with revival. I mean, they play ball two, three nights a week. When I've flown into Las Vegas and had to be there for different things, I'm looking around saying, my gosh, y'all built some nice motels for revival down here. Y'all got huge areas in the basements down here, conference rooms. I mean, you can fit three, four, five, 20,000 people in these rooms. And you got enough place for all of them to sleep. What an awesome place. And you got buffets in between. What an awesome place for revival. <laughs> you got swimming pools for baptisms. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> the devil spent years building that area <laughs> for God's purpose and plan. Oh, yeah, more good places for God to use. Yeah. Now, because people didn't really realize it. The Pensacola at one time, the sheriff came on, the mayor came on and said how their city's blessed from revival economically. I mean, every person that comes, even the police, when they would catch people, it might be their first time uh, crime, first time they've been caught before, and they say, you got an option. You can go to jail or go to revival. I mean, when the police are taking people to revival. Now, a few nights, they said they brought some prostitutes and dropped them off. So it's like, whoa. (laughs) But they're getting born again. Hallelujah. I mean, wouldn't that be good to have a reputation? Police catches somebody in trouble. They say, you got a choice. You can go to jail or go to uh, Gateway on Mount Zion. You know, whatever you want to do. I mean, they got a lot of faith that something's going to happen to those people when they get in that church. (laughs) I I can see the smile of it. Oh, man, just take me to church. Hallelujah. (laughs) They're thinking, how stupid can those cops be? (laughs) Then they got on the parking lot ground and said, what? 
uh, what is that in the air? I'm feeling something here. How about let's just go to jail? Please drop you off and we walk inside. People are doing like. I can see their eyes. I just left the barn. It didn't look like that. See, creative ideas are beginning to come into your heads. <laughs> so, we have some righteous people, we have some praying people. We have a man meeting in the temple to burn incense before the Lord. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell on him. He don't know anybody else that's ever had an encounter with an angel. He's read about some people that had encounters, but he's never met anybody. You know, it's awesome today, most of us, if not personally on YouTube or somewhere, you've met somebody that's had an encounter with an angel before, or you've heard the stories of people, or you've read books about people that have had encounters with angels. So we could be a little bit prepared. A little bit. I probably shared, but there's new people here. During revival, when we were having in Bolivar, one night we, we took uh, my two deacons and one of the deacons' daughter up to this pastor's house to pray. His wife had cancer from a Baptist church. We went up there to pray for him, pray for her. And it's about a 15, 20 mile drive up there. We took the church van and went up there. And so after we got through praying, the, my deacons and Molly, and his daughter, went back out to the van. Molly's about 14. And uh, she was the one I talked about last night going into intercession, having a baby on the bus. And so I s- spent a few more minutes talking to the pastor. If you need anything, call us. We can pray more, whatever. And when I went out to the van and I got in the door and uh, one of the deacons sat behind me, one over beside me, and, and they were just shaking they said there's something in this van (laughs) and both of these guys are big guys i mean 250 pounds it's good to have big bodyguards when you're a little guy and but they're trembling so i mean i'm you know i'm going we've had nice prayer i'm going back out there we we hadn't been happening having this happening we've been having a lot of stuff happening people shaking falling on the ground and we've all been in the middle of it but i step in that van and they're trembling they're like something's in this van (laughs) you know it's usually the women intercessors who are seeing the angels not my big old and they're serious And Molly's toward the back. It's 15 passenger van. And she's back there going, and they're up there about to, he said, when, uh, when the other guy, Tony and, um, his, uh, my other digging, I'll remember his name in a minute. When he grabbed the door of the van, it knocked him on the ground. Just grabbed the door handle to open the van. Now, God has their attention. 
You know, and it really don't matter how many books you read or how many people you talk to about angels. <laughs> Things are getting real right now. I don't, I don't really understand how come they went ahead and got in the van. <laughs> Maybe they thought that something was on the outside. <laughs> I would like to have had a camera. <laughs> Get in there, slam the door, lock it. <laughs> and they don't know they just locked themselves in with the angel. <laughs> so... <laughs> In my mind, I'm thinking, what's wrong with these guys? Because I really, at that point, I wasn't feeling like there was a real major presence. Maybe I was too drunk to notice. But as we're driving back, my guys are really quiet. They're still trying to. But Molly's in the back. Woo! 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 I mean, to the point I'm thinking, somebody calm her down. That is aggravating. (laughs) And then we get to the church, and we have to get her out of the church van and put her in my van so I can take them home. And we had to carry her out of the van into my van which didn't have a back seat. It, it was a Ford Aerostar, had one bench seat, two captain's chairs, nothing in the back. And she's still back there, woo, 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 you know. <laughs> so we, now this city is Bolivar, Tennessee, which is the city that has the oldest mental health institute in the state of Tennessee. <laughs> It looks like one of those big, huge, brick, old buildings. It's built in the late 1800s, like, you know, the the horror movies. It used to be for the criminally insane. Bars and all, you know, over the windows, everything. And so in the past, you know, years with the government, they've let a lot of people out of there just to be in the community. So I decided we'd go buy Hardee's and get some sweet tea. I mean, that seems like a good thing to do. (laughs) We go through the drive-thru, and the lady's about to hand my stuff out, and here's three grown men, and Molly climbs up over the back seat, and she's back going, whoo, whoo, (laughs) whoo. And we're all looking at each other. And the, the lady with the T's looking. <laughs> so do you really want this? Your time's coming. Humility comes in very many different forms. It sneaks up on you when you're least expecting it. Then we finally, I finally got them to their house. Turn the lights off. Don't let no neighbors see us. (laughs) Because we having to grab, you know, grab the arms and grab the legs and carry her in the house. Of course, there's her mother. We're carrying her in, and she's, oh, oh, oh. We got her put in the recliner. She just like tripping. Her mother's looking at her. Her mother's looking at us. Luckily, we had been in revival for a week or so, so, I mean, she wasn't totally flipped out, but it it was still stirring her up. And this, uh, 15 minutes, she's just like, and her eyes are twice, she has big eyes anyway, but they're twice as big as they were before. And she wasn't really blinking. She's just like sitting in that chair, whoa, whoa, whoa. 
It got so bad, I thought, this girl is going to have a heart attack. I mean, it was just like, her, her heart's got to be beating 150, 200 beats a minute. And so we're putting her, calm down, peace, be still, peace. It's one of the few times I'm ever saying peace. I'm usually saying more, more. But now I'm saying less, less. (laughs) And in my mind, I'm saying don't let her die. (laughs) Because I'm still not sure what's happening. Nobody gave me a book on that. (laughs) How to carry somebody home that's had an angel encounter. (laughs) After about 15 minutes, she finally calmed down. Like, praise God. Could you imagine taking her to the hospital? (laughs) So she calmed down. And then I'm saying, what happened? And she's like, she can't talk. She's trying to talk, but she can't talk. So I said, get her pencil and paper. I mean, that's what we had to do. So she starts writing. Big angel. Now reality's hitting me. Oh my gosh. We had an angel in our van. (laughs) I missed it again. Where was my camera? I was having a Kodak moment. But I was just happy. It was, you know, I'm having a heart attack. No, praise God. And then finally in about 10 or 15 more minutes, she could finally begin to talk. And she said, she said, there was a big angel standing in front of me like this. And said, the glory of God was coming off of the angel and hitting me directly. And that's how come it was all she could do was, oh, oh, oh. I mean, it's awesome to see an angel, but I hadn't read about many encounters like the angel just standing there in the glory of the Lord. You know, somebody said the powerful thing about angels, the difference, one of the difference between angels and demons, angels are ascending and descending to the throne of God and getting a fresh glory application. And so they come back down with fresh new glory. The demons can't go get that. They're running an old, stale, dried up. Woo. So the glory of the Lord. Wow. That angel. So we can have some feeling of what Zacharias may have felt when it said he was troubled and fear came on him. You know, it's, it's okay when the supernatural, when the presence of God, when the glory of the Lord, it may be joy, it may be shaking, it may be laughter, and it may be fear. I mean, God, and it's, it's amazing, you know, you don't really see prophecies of, specifically about Zacharias, God picked some people out. The amazing thing is you don't know when he's picking you out, when it's your time. That's why I want to read a little bit of uh, one of the Psalms, Psalm 73. And David's talking about something.
I'm just going to read through here kind of quickly. 73.1, truly God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Yeah. See, the, there's people the enemy will prosper. And we were talking about the other night that, you know, they used to say that Hollywood, a lot of people signed their name and sold their self out to Satan. And people didn't believe that in the past, but we're beginning to see that that was probably true. And then fame and prosperity came. And David's here saying this. I was envious of the boastful. Sometimes we can be envious of those who look like they have fame and fortune. For there are no pangs in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men. They are, they are not plagued like other men. Therefore, pride serves at their necklace. Violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes bulge with abundance. They have more than heart could wish. They scoff and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. Boy, isn't it those that seem to have the most, that seem to be talking the most about what it means not to have nothing. I'd say that again, but I don't think I can remember it. You have to go back and watch. <laughs> they set their mouth against the heavens. Well, there's some people that will boldly set their mouth against God. Yeah. And it's getting more bold. Yeah. And their tongue walks through the earth. Therefore, his people return here and waters of a full cup are drained by them. And they say, how does God know? And there is knowledge in the Most High. And is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly who are always at ease. They increase in riches. Look, David's saying they're increasing in riches. They seem to be blessed everywhere. Everything they put their hand on seems to be blessed. You know, we, we, it, it makes us think I need to compromise or I may be, must be doing something wrong. Because I'm not having the success that God promised. The wealth of the wicked is stored up for the righteous. God, where is this success? Why are these people who, who mock you and spit in your face, why are they increasing? Surely I have cleansed my heart in vain. David's saying, I've repented before the Lord and it must be in vain because it doesn't appear to be doing me any good. And I've washed my hands in innocence. For all day long I've been plagued and chastened every morning. If I'd said I will speak thus, behold, I would have been untrue to the generation of your children. When I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me. Until I went into the sanctuary. Until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their end. Surely you set them in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction. Oh, how they are brought to desolation in a moment. They are utterly consumed with terror. It may appear that some are getting by for the time, but one day there's a judgment day. One day there's a day where everybody will stand before the king of glory and make an account for their lives. And they may appear to have all the success on this earth. And it may appear that those who have gone after heaven and gone after God and lived a righteous life, why are they cast down? Why do they seem to be plagued? But even if it appears that day, this is but for a short time. Eternity is coming. Woo! No matter what happens on this earth, the important thing about this journey is we have a right heart before God. Because this time on earth is as a breath. But one day, He's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Come and check this mansion out that I prepared for you. Come walk with me down these streets of gold. Come get a drink out of the river of life. 
Woo! And all those sorrows and any of those griefs and any of those pains that were in the past life will, slow, will quickly drift away. <laughs> you won't be looking at what you went through down there. You'll be looking at what you're about to face up there. Isn't it worth 50, 70 years of holiness to have eternity with the king of glory? Woo. They may prosper all they want. They may drive brand new cars. They have, may have big, huge houses. They may mock God and speak evil of the heavens. Don't let it bother you. Pray for them. Pray that God will turn their hearts. But don't let it compel you to compromise your walk with God. Don't sell out for the almighty dollar. Don't sell out for fame and fortune. (laughs) Sell out for being famous in heaven. Woo! (laughs) Sell out for this. When you go into the room with somebody that's possessed by a devil. And you say in the name of Jesus, come out. That that devil doesn't say, Jesus I know and Paul I know. But who are you? No, you want them to say, Jesus I know and you I know. And I'm about to leave. I want to be famous in heaven. I want the devils to know my name. And I want the angels to know my name. Who cares if men know our names? I guarantee you if heaven knows your name, though, men will begin to know your name. Woo. They'll find out who you are. Satarabo kurienda bashata. Ooh, those seven sons of Sceva. It was a bad day. I've watched some of that cage boxing. I've never seen anybody get the clothes beat off of them. <laughs> but that one devil beat the clothes plumb off all seven of those brothers. Run them down the street naked. I mean, what do you think they say in the neighborhood? (laughs) Some probably probably had that that demon-possessed man was locked in a house and some people got together, raised some money. We're going to buy. We're going we're gonna to send for the seven sons of Sceva. They're coming to town to do a deliverance ministry. They probably showed up and got out of their chariot. We have arrived. Take me to the green room. Get my fruit ready. We're about to cast the devil out of that man. You can go ahead and put that money on PayPal. $500 down and 500 when we're finished. <laughs> and we're all excited and the seven sons are walking down the street, you know. They walk in the door. <laughs> and the devil goes over and locks the door. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> we adjure you to come out. By the name that Paul preaches, the name of Jesus. I bet they got about as troubled as Zacharias did when the angel showed up. 
When it didn't come out, it just got mad. How do you beat seven people up till you beat the clothes off of them before they can get out of the building? (laughs) People are probably gathered around the outside. Man, them seven sons are taking it to him now. (laughs) Come on, you skeeva boys. All of a sudden, they hear the door unlock. (laughs) Here comes seven naked priests. (laughs) And the guy's saying, hey, do we get a refund? you stand before men, it's how you stand before devils. If you're right with God, you don't have to fear no devil. That's why I said it's sad that men today are writing books and they're afraid of an antichrist, a false prophet, and a beast. Oh, I'm not kidding. Oh, the antichrist is coming on the scene. Oh, he's going to do this. It's going to be terrible. The false prophet and the beast are coming on the scene. My thought is if somebody has more power, if somebody's carrying some greater anointing, then what's living inside of me, the same spirit that went into the grave and raised Jesus from the dead, If there's any devils out there that have more power, that same spirit is the Holy Spirit living inside of us. If there's any devil out there, any false prophet, any beast, any antichrist that has more power, we're serving the wrong God. If you're around somebody and say, man, the antichrist, and people start, oh my goodness. They need to get full of the Holy Ghost. I mean, there's something God wants to fill you. The Holy Ghost wasn't afraid to bust hell wide open right in front of Satan and all of his minions, all of his generals, all of his principalities, all of his powers, putting guard around Jesus. He wasn't afraid to break right in the middle of them and resurrect his dead body. And my gosh, Romans 8 says, that same spirit, Paul said, that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is living in me. Woo! That ought to make us the craziest people on earth. You know, the Lord told Heidi Baker, she would just run and jump in the middle of a riot. She said, Heidi, I'm trying to keep you alive. <laughs> Could you stop doing that? <laughs> you know, I, I believe those heroes that we look up to are, are models. They're, they don't want to be, say, I'm something special and I've got something you can't have. They're trying to demonstrate for us what's available. You know, she... She actually was in college in Mississippi, if some of you saw her movie or testimony, and, and you had the option to stay and clean the college dormitory or go to a revival meeting at an Indian Native American church. And it was at that that she went to the Native American church and God baptized her in the Holy Spirit. Changed everything. Woo, and then she went to Toronto. I mean, it's hard to explain. If you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit... That there's still more. Yeah. Then she goes to Toronto years later, burn out from ministry. And she's, I mean, she's had a mental, physical breakdown for a month. Because they were working 
14, 16 hours a day for seven or eight years. And all that time, they'd only planted four churches. I think two of them were already quit. And she heard about Toronto, and her husband took her up there. She's laying on the floor at the altar, and Randy Clark's looking at her, and he said, Heidi, God says, do you want Mozambique? I realize they've not been to Mozambique. Her husband had been to Mozambique previous to their coming home. And Heidi, they talked on the phone, and she said, what's it like? He said, it's great. They're blowing up Red Cross trucks. Now, when you're blowing up the Red Cross, there's some trouble going on. But they weren't physically, mentally, spiritually prepared to go there yet. And so now at this altar service at Toronto, Randy Clark is saying, God said, Heidi, do you want Mozambique? I think he said it about three times. And finally she said, yes. And when she said that, the power of the Holy Spirit fell on her for seven days. Sounds good for 30 minutes. To where she said somebody had to come and give me water to drink because I could not even help myself take a drink. A woman security guard would carry me, she's a little bitty lady, to the restroom and then bring me back out and lay me on the floor. About three or four days, her husband said, Heidi, don't you think this is enough? I guess she said, no, it's not. God's not through. Seven days. They would go back over the next seven or eight years and plant, what is it, 20,000 churches. She is filled with the Holy Spirit. But something else came. I believe it was an apostolic anointing. I mean, we don't know what gifts. The the baptism of the Holy Spirit opens the door for God to deposit whatever else or either manifest whatever else he wants to manifest. That's why we keep coming and praying. Okay, heaven, do what you need to do. God, have your way. To me, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is like opening the doors to the castle. If you think of an old knights of the round table and you go into the castle, it, it says when you enter into the kingdom by the water and the spirit. It's what John, Jesus was talking to Nicodemus. You must be born again to see the kingdom. But to enter in, you must be born of the water and the spirit. So is that the baptism of the Holy Spirit to enter into the kingdom? See, people that are not filled with the Spirit realize there is a kingdom, but they don't know much about it. But by the Spirit, only by the Spirit can you enter into the kingdom. And then the great thing, when you go through the front door, the treasure chest is not right there in the front door. It's hidden somewhere in some secret room. So you got to explore the kingdom to get all the stuff. Different rooms have different things. And so don't stand by the doorpost and just hang out right there. Go on in. So something, she is... Opened the door for the kingdom, but something was manifest there in the kingdom that I don't believe it was a, just an anomaly, just something special only for Heidi. And I, I don't believe, I don't know that everybody will plant that many churches, but it's showing what's available for each one of us, something that takes us out of our rim. Something that goes beyond the natural. When I was growing up, I was just pretty quiet and shy. I mind my own business. Tried to stay out of trouble. Because my dad was about 220 and he knew how to use a belt. So I had some motivation. (laughs) 
But then I got saved at 29. <clears throat> I got baptized in the Holy Ghost at 30. Became a pastor about five years later. My first funeral was my aunt's funeral. And I'd been praying. That was in Houston, Texas. I lived in Tennessee. I'd been praying, and I'll end with this. I'd been praying for my cousins, for my uncles and other aunts and family members that somebody would tell them about Jesus. Several of them had been to church. Some of them hadn't been. But I was praying for them that they would have an opportunity to hear about Jesus. I didn't know I would go back to Houston to preach my aunt's funeral. My first funeral would be my aunt. And all of my family would be sitting there. I didn't know God would use me to be the one to share with all of them about Jesus. And my sermon was, everybody wants to go to Aunt Nancy's house. And in the natural, she was always very pleasant. She was actually a pastor's wife. But she had cookies. She, I mean, she was always a hostess. And so everybody liked to go to Aunt Nancy's house. So I said, Aunt Nancy has another house now. Yeah. Yeah. Woo, and everybody's going to want to go there too. But there's only one way. And... I preach a funeral kind of like I preach revival. My family lined up, you know, you had the viewing of the casket, and then we had a guy that was in church with a lot of, that would have been a good idea, was in church. People knew him. He, was, he sang some of the songs he, was, he sang at churches, and family members knew him and invited him, and he knew my aunt, and so he came to sing, and, and I'm standing there. And also found out I had an 80-year-old aunt that had been down in Mexico, a great aunt, that nobody had ever talked about. And she came in the pastor's room there where, you know, you're praying before the service. She comes in the room there. She said, I heard you as filled with the Holy Ghost. I said, yeah. And she said, I am too. I've been down on the mission field in Mexico. I said, well, pray for me. She said, praise God. <laughs> Found out later she's the crazy aunt nobody talks about. So we're, you know, at the end, had the viewing of the coffin, and then we're standing here, and they come by to shake your hand. And the worship, the singer leans over to me and said, I ain't never heard a funeral like that before. <laughs> I said, that's okay. I never preached a funeral before. <laughs> well, I don't think I'd had one of those yet. <laughs> Uh, we kind of had a fire shake your hand as you go by. <laughs> and one, one of my cousins, he's shaking my hand. He said, will you preach my funeral? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my uncle, my aunt, my cousin, all these, will you preach my funeral? <laughs> I'm like, I guess so. I don't, you know. and they, they have not seen me since I was saved, since I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. I mean, growing up as kids and stuff, and I'd not been back to Houston, and here I come back, fire, you know, and they're all looking, I mean, and yeah, I can see their faces. <laughs> it's the same body, but something has possessed you. <laughs> that's what happens. I mean, see, that's the change that the Holy Spirit, whoo, same body, but something else is there. And you know what? In 25 years since then, it's getting better. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They won't even let me preach a funeral anymore. <laughs> Hallelujah. Great evangelistic service. Hallelujah. Lord, we bless you. God, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy. Thank you for what you're doing in our midst. God, we thank you that you came and visited 
Zechariah, God. That it was the right time. What amazing thing when he came from that meeting to speak for the next nine months. I haven't read about anybody that couldn't talk for nine months after revival. I wonder what he thought about for those nine months. I wonder if he had trouble getting up in the morning and saying, bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Forget not all of his benefits. Forgives my iniquities, heals my diseases. Crowns me with loving kindness and tender mercies. Renews my youth like that of an eagle. Bless the Lord. I bet he was a man that was undone. People had to come by just to look at him he couldn't talk something happened to Zacharias he was in the temple something happened to him he was a different man shame is gone from Elizabeth's face She had to go away to the mountains. Maybe just, I mean, she's carrying a miracle. Nobody's seen a miracle in 400 years. She's doing something that she's read about. blessings of Sarah what man said was impossible God has saved for me could you imagine every day you're carrying that miracle inside of you there's no earthly way that this could happen but God. Then Mary comes to visit. When she walks in the room, Spirit of God hits that baby. He's filled with the Holy Ghost. He's born. Zachariah's mouth open, he begins to prophesy. You know, there had to be crowds. Elizabeth's having her baby today. That miracle baby is coming. I just feel called right now, Lord, to pray. God, if there's women that are watching this or here tonight and their womb has been shut up, God, that you would supernaturally open their womb, Lord. Sata.
It happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, that the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Then she spoke out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. But why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Wow, as soon as the Holy Spirit came, she discerned, this is Jesus. This is the mother of my Lord. For as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe looped and leaped in my womb for joy. Blessed is he who, should, who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her. Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord. And my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. For he has regarded this lowly state of his maidservant. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me. And holy is his name. And his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm and he has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed. Elizabeth came time for her to deliver and she brought forth a son and her neighbors and relatives heard how the Lord has shown great mercy to her and they rejoiced with her. When they came to circumcise the child on the eighth day, they would have called him by the name of his father, Zacharias. His mother answered and said, no, he shall be called John. But they said to her, there is no one among your relatives who is called by this name. So they made signs to the father what he would call him. And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote down, his name is John. And they all marveled. And immediately his mouth was open and his tongue loosed and he spoke, praising God. And fear came on all those who dwelt around and all those sayings were discussed throughout all the hill country of Judea. And all those who heard there kept them in their hearts, saying, What kind of child will this be? And the hand of the Lord was with them, and his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. Blessed is the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets who have been since the world began, then we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. To perform the mercies promised of our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. The oath he swore to our father Abraham to grant us and we being delivered from the hand of the enemies might serve him without fear and holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the highest, for you will go before the face of the Lord and prepare his ways to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the remission of their sins. Through the tender mercy of our God, with which the day spring from on high has visited us, to give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death, guide our feet into the way of peace. Lord, thank you that you've granted us the privilege of your presence. 
God, thank you that you love us and you care about us, God. You cover out every situation that everybody in this house is going through. Thank you for your glory, God, that's settling on people. God, that the reality of the gospel is becoming real. That the heavens are being manifested. That the kingdom of God is at hand. That you're working in your people, Lord. You've not left us. You've not abandoned us. You've not turned us over to wrath. But God, you're working on behalf of your people. Lord, I just, I pray that there's a settling. God, I pray that there's an encounter. That there's a closeness. Draw near to me and I'll draw near to you. God, we're here to draw near. God, thank you that we don't have to go 400 years to hear from God. Thank you, Lord, that you're establishing the prophetic. God, you are raising up and manifesting the prophets, the apostles, pastors, teachers, evangelists. Thank you that you're preparing your army your disciples, men and women of renown. That when they walk in a room and they say, you got to go in the name of Jesus, that the devils will tremble and shake. And they'll scream as they leave out of people's bodies because they can't get out of the room fast enough. Lord, that you're baptizing people in Holy Ghost and fire, Lord. Holy Ghost and fire. And God, what, what men say was impossible. You're saying with God, all things are possible. What people and looked at and judged in the flesh, God, you're looking at in the spirit. You're looking at the heart of the matter. God, you're refining our hearts, purifying our motives and our thoughts. So that we can draw close to you, God. So that we can walk in your glory, God, and it won't kill us. So that we can be like Moses. If you don't go with me, I'm not going, God. God, that we can stand on the mountaintop and come down and be glowing because we've been in your presence, Lord. God, that we can enjoy, no matter how good you are today, there's even more for tomorrow. Woo! Whoa! Ha! Woo! Man! That's like eating strawberry cheesecake, putting the other piece in the refrigerator, and when it comes out tomorrow, it's better than it was today. Oh, yeah! How do you explain this stuff? Let's just stand. Hallelujah. If you're here or you're at home in a house fire, 
We pray the glory of the Lord is just descending upon you. We pray that healings and miracles are happening in your household. Yes. We pray that you know tonight that Jesus loves you. Yes. And if God could visit Mary and Elizabeth and Zacharias, and he could visit us today. If he visited on the book of Acts, the upper room, He longs to come and be with us. We long to be with him. Woo. We, we welcome you, God. We welcome you into this gateway, God. God, let it just be the gateway of heaven, Lord. Shatarabakariataramasata. Let it be the gateway to heaven, God. Let it be the gateway to people's transformation where lives are changed. So we bless you if you've never received Jesus into your life. He's standing the door knocking. Conviction. God, I pray conviction. I pray that hearts would be stirred up that Heaven wants to, to come in and live inside of you. Jesus wants to live inside of you. If you believe this gospel, if you believe what the Bible says, that God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son. Whoever believed in him should not perish but have eternal life. If you believe what Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John say, if you believe what Paul speaks, That Jesus came, Son of God, God in the flesh, man in the flesh, lived a perfect life, born of a virgin. Healed the sick, raised the dead, cast out demons, cleansed the lepers. Went to the hurting. Loved the broken. Restored the prostitutes. Cast the demons out of those that were bound up. What he did 2,000 years ago, he can do today. Open your heart. Just ask him, Jesus, I believe you're the son of God. You came to this earth for me. You died on a cross for me. You're crucified, buried in a grave raised from the dead Lord I repent of my sins and I repent that I've gone my own way and not your way and God I turn from those sins and I turn towards you and I want to follow you with all my heart I change my mind today God I ask you to come into my heart and live there take control change me Lord if you just pray a prayer like that Jesus will come Hallelujah. Wow. Satara. Man, they're just a special presence of the Lord. God's touching your heart tonight. I believe He's given us an opportunity just to draw close to Him. Yes. Yes. I believe as we make a physical step, as we as we do something in the natural, I believe something in the spiritual is going to happen. Yes. Yes. So I'm I'm just inviting you tonight to take a step, two steps, twenty steps, and let's just gather together for a minute. I mean, a lot of times Friday night we have a fire tunnel, but I don't know, there's a different. Shut up. Lord, I just pray every step people make that we're drawing physically and spiritually closer to the Lord. God, that something is happening. 
God, I just pray that things are even falling off of us because we're saying, I want Jesus. I want Jesus. I want heaven to come. Come on up if you can. If you need to sit in one of the front chairs, that's fine too.